This is Paul Gregg talking about uh, backyard roller coasters. One question that uh, I get a lot is why don't you make a track with a loop? So I'm thinking back 40 years to my physics class in college and uh, uh, I'm not sure I'm doing this right. But uh, if somebody sees a mistake, I'd really appreciate you uh, correcting me. But this is kind of my thoughts about uh, what it would take to do a, a loop. And the uh, physics involved with it. So basically, um, in about the 1980s, uh, people realized that uh, trying to do a loop with a constant radius circle was really a difficult thing to do because... Uh, to keep people being pushed into their seats, positive Gs, at the top of the loop, you had to really go fast at the bottom of the loop. And uh, and that's kind of what uh, the conclusion here is, too. Uh, what they came up with, and you'll see this uh, in uh, all modern well-designed coasters, is what's called a clothoid loop. Uh, it involves at least two radii. So there's a big radii going into the loop, and then there's a small radii at the top. Now, in a professional roller coaster, you can have different radii all the way along here, so have some kind of an elliptical or some kind of a higher order function to do that. But for purposes of talking about it right now, I'm just going to say there's two radiuses, a big radius on the, on the bottom going into the loop, and then a small radius up there. And I'll explain the reason for doing that. Uh, this is the height of the hill here, point number one. The cart and the rider go down down here to the bottom at point two. Here's where they're going the fastest. And it's pretty simple. Um, once you get used to it, the, the, you have potential energy up here. And I've covered this elsewhere, but I'll, I'll go through it quickly again. Um, potential in the up Potential energy up here is equal to the mass times the gravitational constant, which is always the same on the face of the Earth, times the height. Okay, H1 is the height at point 0.1. Um, so we have a certain amount of uh, joules of energy for a certain height. And then we go down here at the, at the bottom of this thing is where we're going the fastest at point 0.2. Um, I don't account for drag and f air drag and, and friction until the very end and I kind of make a general thing. So let's not think about drag right away. So if all that energy, all that potential energy at point one is converted to kinetic energy or energy in motion at point two, we see we have a velocity here if it's all converted. And uh, that's calculated over here. If you don't know how a spreadsheet works, these are just a bunch of uh, input and output cells. Um, the green ones are my critical input. These are input as well. Some of these are constants, and then the output cells are down here, the critical ones. They have equations in them. So some, some cells have values, and some cells have the result of an equation. And if you want to see what the equation is, you can click on the cell and look up here, and it tells you which cell and which row and column cell is used to do different things, okay? I'm not going to go through that in detail, but uh, that's, a, that's a great skill to have. So we're down at point two. We're going to velocity, and the velocity at, at uh, uh, and then we go back up this hill. And what, whenever you're in a in a curve like this, you have a centripetal acceleration due to the uh, curvature of the track, and that acceleration is this very important formula here. Centripetal acceleration is equal to the velocity squared divided by the radius of the the curve. So that's a very useful thing. And, and I think just for safety purposes, I wouldn't want to make a roller coaster where when you got up here, you were going really slow and were hanging. Gravity was pulling you out of the seat. I, I think some people have done that in the past, but I, I didn't want, I wouldn't want to do that. If somebody forgot to attach their, their seat belt, they'd fall right out. So at the, at the very minimum, I want it to be going fast enough at point three where the weight uh, equaled the centripetal acceleration. So the weight in the downward direction would equal the centripetal acceleration uh, force 
in the upward direction. So right at a little point there, you'd feel weightless. But other than that, you'd feel being pushed into the downward into the cart. And I'd really want to go a little faster than that. So I always felt a little bit of force pushing me into the cart. Um, and then you come out of it. You come here in the small radius, radius uh, 2, radius centripetal 2. And then you come into a big, you transition to a big radius. You don't want to do these transitions uh, abruptly for reasons I talk about elsewhere. Uh, but uh, having to do with the, the um, offset accelerations on, on your head, that's not really on the track. It's up in here. But anyway, you come out and you go to uh, position number four and you're going without any drag. You'd be going as fast as you are at two. So as we go through the calculations, uh, radius, the critical things are the uh, radius number one, the big radius, and radius two, the small radius. Uh, I have them in meters here because I do all the calculations in the metric system. For information purposes, here is uh, the equivalent of three meters is 9.84 feet and so on down here. Um, the mass really doesn't matter. It gets moved in and out of the equations, but uh, I, I've said there was a 180, 198 pound or a 90 kilogram rider in a 33 pound cart, which is reasonable. Um, there's the total mass. So I'm saying my assumption is that uh, the rider's weightless at 0.3, and so the centripetal force in the up direction is equal to the weight in the down direction. And I come up with this little equation here. Uh, I know what the weight is. Uh, in newtons. So the velocity at point number three there is 3.3 meters per second or seven miles an hour. Um, and that's enough to keep me still just barely weightless there. The delta H is uh, the distance between this high point here and the, and the, the high point here. Really the center of gravity is not right at the track, but I'm, I'm I'm not dealing with that right now. I'm trying to simplify this. So half a meter delta. So down here, this is what the uh, total height, height, height one is, is uh, four and a half meters or, or nearly 15 feet. The velocity at uh, two, I'm going 9.4 meters per second or over 20 miles an hour right down at that point there. Real, I still has to go pretty fast in there. Uh, I can calculate the downward centripetal forces through that curve, add it to 1 to one g of gravity, and my total g's at the bottom there are 4 g's. So I'm going to weigh four times what I normally do. I'm going to feel like I weigh uh, 800 pounds at the bottom of that thing. That's And if it's not for too long, that's not too bad. There is a roller coaster in South Africa that goes 5.3 g's just for a very short time, but... 3 G's is really typical for most roller coasters as a maximum. And some of these these uh, new fancy ones might go higher than that, but not too many. So this is a wicked ride. It's uh, it's really going to be zooming through there. You're going to really feel a lot of force through there. Uh, I put a one and a half factor safety, so I know what the loads are. And uh, you probably want some positive G's at 0.3, like I said. And so it should probably start a meter higher than it really did. So I was really saying, okay, this has to be four and a half meters high, which is almost 15 feet. I'm going to say to account for drag and to give myself a little bit of the positive G's at number three, I'm going to go a meter higher than that. So I'm going to start at 18 feet high. That's pretty high for a backyard roller coaster. And so I don't, you know, I'd be hesitant to, to even start something like that. Now, so this is the clothoid loop. It's a, it's a, has at least a, a small radius at the top and a, and a big radius at the, at down at the bottoms. Um, if you want to see what a circular loop does, you just make the radii the same here. So if I, if I said I'm still going to have a, a radius here of three meters, but I'm going to make a three meter um, thing up here, it's just going to be a big circle. I can just input three there and see what happens. Well, what really happens, you can see, I had the cell turn red if it was above four. So now this is six G's going through 0.2. And I'm going uh, 12 meters per second or 27 miles an hour. 
really hauling through that thing and then going up and making a big circle and, and hitting six G's at the bottom of that thing. Six G's fighter pilots can do sustained nine G's if they have a pressure suit on that's compressing their legs and, and torso to keep the blood up into their um, heads. Um, six G's, you could probably, a healthy person could probably sustain that for less than a second through that thing, but it's, it's getting pretty wicked. Uh, plus you'd, uh, the height, I'd have to go to 28 feet or eight and a half meters. That's, that's really quite high, higher than I'd want to want to do. Cause you really, I need a chain lift then it's a lot more expensive, a lot more dangerous. So I'm going to go back and, and say that's a one meter up there in my cloth. Oil. That's a pretty tight radius really on the top there that you, your cart would have to be able to, to do that properly too. So there's a lot of design work to do there. Um, if you want to, okay, circular loop, we did that. Velocity must be high, high enough to make the loop with some to spare. Large curve radii means a tall coaster. We found that out. Yeah, we have high G's in a small coaster. Large ro roller coasters, you know, the, they have a lot more bigger radii because they're a lot bigger coaster. And so you don't worry too much about the, the, the head dynamic path versus where the, the track is. Um, you know, if you want low G's, you get a large radius, but if you get a large radius, the track gets really high. So that's the difficulty. And some of these other issues, I think I cover in other uh, presentations a little better. So that's it. I, I put two links down here. The blue flash uh, guy in Ohio, I think a really good welder made this thing that if you look at the video closely you'll see is the guy the rider's heads are kind of jerked around it it looks pretty scary uh the coaster looks kind of inefficient as far as uh how 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 good the rollers are and everything like that but it's very impressive uh a backyard roller coaster amazing thing the other one uh that's of note is in the rose parade uh, roller coaster in 1984 i think uh, Caltech or somebody must have had a lot to do with that, but it's, uh, I noticed they only did it once. They didn't do it again. Uh, it got stuck a couple times with people. And this, this is a, a roller coaster on a parade float with people, with kids in it. And, uh, it looks, it does look like it has a circular loop and it looks like they are in danger of falling out when they really go slow through that top of that loop. But it's still an amazing feat of engineering, uh, for a small roller coaster. And that is a that's a synopsis of a spreadsheet that that I think is telling me accurately what it would take to do a loop. Um, I made some conservative assumptions that we could you know you could revisit this and and uh, and look at it again. And but if you find something wrong, uh, a real physics guy, a uh, physicist someone who knows more than I do and learned it uh, more recently. If you find something wrong with this, uh, my calculations here or anything, please tell me. Otherwise, uh, thanks for, thanks for looking at it.